Dr. Ikonomu is a member of the Center for Regenerative Medicine of Boston University and Boston Medical Center and an affiliate member of the BU Biomedical Engineering Department. His major research interests are in the areas of pluripotent stem cell biology, developmental biology, and stem cell engineering, with emphasis on lung and thyroid differentiation. In addition to his research, Dr. Ikonomu has been involved for several years in education and information activities regarding unproven and unregulated stem cell interventions from respiratory diseases as a member of the American Thoracic Society Stem Cell Working Group. He currently continues these efforts through the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy Presidential Task Force on the use of unproven and or unethical cell and gene therapy. With that, um, Dr. Economo, thank you for your time today. Thanks so much. So, in the next hour or so, I would like to talk to you about the um, emerging industry uh, that offers improved stem cell interventions to patients, and I would like to demonstrate why this is a big fraud and scientifically dubious. So, I don't like to be, like to be a monologue. You can interrupt me at any time if you can if you have questions or objections or whatever. Okay. So, let's see. I always like to start with some definitions, and this is particularly important in that case because, as you will see, how scientists understand, for example, terms such as regenerative medicine, stem cell progenitor cell, or cell replacement therapy are different uh, from the understanding of the public, and uh, of course, uh, they're very different by the way uh, businesses that offer improved stem cell interventions interpret these terms. I assume not everybody is familiar with STEM, so starting with uh, the term of regenerative medicine, that's the official NIH uh, definition, that is the process of creating living functional tissues to repair, repair or replace tissue uh, or organ function. So that, uh, of course, includes stem cell biology. You use stem cells in regenerative medicine, but it's a more general term because you use other types of cells. We use gene therapy. We can even use small, small molecules known as regenerative pharmacology to uh, mobilize endogenous uh, progenitor stem cells. Now, what is a progenitor cell? That's a generic term to describe any dividing cell with the capacity to differentiate. And in fact, uh, in the human body, of the various organisms that are not only stem cells, but a lot of regeneration happens through progenitor cells. And a stem cell, that's the classical definition of a stem cell. Uh, there are two pro properties here. It's a cell that can continuously self-replicate, and as it replicates, but it maintains the ability to produce daughter cells that have different, more restricted properties. So that's called the progeny of a stem cell. And finally, the cell replacement therapy is reconstitution of tissue by functional incorporation of transplanted stem cell project. This is very important to understand because it's distinct from what we call a bystander trophic effect. Some cells can have an anti-inflammatory or a trophic effect when transplanted. And a lot of cell therapies that are offered by the business I'm going to talk to you about uh, are not stem cells. And they may have this type of effects. Uh, and they are definitely not self replacement therapies. Is there a So, how do we use stem cells in regenerative medicine? As I mentioned, there are two ways to do that, two major ways. One is mobilization of endogenous stem or progenitor cells, or we can use stem cells ex vitro or uh, ex vivo or in vitro to differentiate them to clinically relevant cells, and then we can transplant them. We can transplant them as cells, or can try to make a tissue-like structure and then transplant the structure. Currently, the only proven and regula uh, approved, uh, regulatory approved stem cell-based therapeutic modality is bone marrow or umbilical cord transplants. And they are both sources of hematopoietic stem cells. And these are limited to a very defined category of disorders, uh, namely hematological disorders. And I'm this is very important for what I do, uh, and you see it's very important for the last part of my talk that I've not proved stem or cell based, stem cell or cell based therapies for disease of the respiratory system. So, 
I talk about regenerative medicine, and I would like in the next couple of slides to give you a, a snapshot of the of this field, where we are. You hear about regenerative medicine; it's a very exciting field, but practically, do we have any practice? Uh, so that comes from a report uh, uh, Nati Quente and I wrote uh, last year as part of the ISCT Presidential Task Force. So we try to find out uh, how many cell and gene therapies have marketing authorization worldwide. And that means how many therapies are approved by regulatory agencies uh, in the, around the world. And as you can see here, there are more than four, uh, 40. Uh, there are 16 in the United States. Half of them are, in fact, uh, hematopoietic stem cell uh, therapies, uh, transplants. In other countries, this is not a cell therapy is uh, considered a medical intervention. There are nine in Europe, there are a lot in South Korea because it has more lax regulatory framework. Currently five in Japan, two in Australia, four in India, and two in Canada, and one in one or two in China. So there are cell therapies and gene therapies have been approved. They've been gone through uh, rigorous testing, clinical trials, and have provided patients. And as you can see here, most of them are uh, cell-based therapies. There are some gene therapies. Uh, the, ma the vast majority is opolobus, uh, also allogeneic, comes from another donor. And as far as the disease type is concerned, there are a variety of conditions for skeletal diseases, oncology, hematology. The CAR T, you most probably hear about all the time in the news, is a ma major boost now in cell and gene therapies. There are also therapies for skin, eye diseases, and cardiovascular diseases. So this is a promising field, and in fact, it's been delivered already. And these are data, current data from the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, so I have to mention this is an industry consortium, and you also have to be careful how you interpret this data. Uh, so what they mentioned in their latest uh, report is that there are more than 1,000 clinical trials that employ either gene or cell therapies. And as you can see here, there is a variety of gene therapies, gene-modified cell therapies, cell therapies and uh, a minority of tissue engineering uh, clinical trials. So I think from that, it's obvious it's a very active, a promising field. At the same time, as you can see here in that graph, the top uh, 10 global causes of deaths that's a, a graph from the World Health Organization. Uh, there are a lot of conditions that are chronic conditions, such as COPD, the ischemic heart disease. So there are a lot of patients that live for many years, very low quality of life, and sometimes the only uh, treatment or cure is transplants. For example, in later stages of COPD, the only therapeutic option is uh, uh, either palliative care, if, uh, there is no, there's no tra tra transplant or a lung transplant that comes, of course, with a lot of comorbidities. And uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about how we go from the preclinical research, from the lab, uh, to deliver these therapies to patients, and why this is important. Why do we have to go through this pipeline? to deliver these products, why it sometimes takes many, many years to do that, and why offering improved stem cell interventions to patients is not optimal. So how we go from bench to bench side is a very complex process. We need a lot of preclinical research. Uh, we, of course, once we have uh, good data that support uh, the, the efficacy, the potential safety and efficacy of the treatment, we have to go through clinical trials, how this is conducted, how the therapy is going to the pipeline is, of course, affected by regulatory frameworks, and then uh, promising cell or gene therapies and the cell or gene therapy pipeline. And this is from uh, 10 years ago. It was from a science perspective written by somebody from the FDA. As you can see here, to special for stem cell-based products, there should be very rigorous preclinical testing and careful characterization of both the stem cells and their progeny. Uh, because these cells, we have to make sure that they differentiate to something that is functional. But once they've been transplanted into a patient, there are several concerns we have to address. If there are multiple mechanisms of function, 
if cells can migrate, if they can form ectopic tissues, not necessarily tumors, but also if they can form tumors. So this is very important, especially when we talk about stem cells, and um, particularly to report the stem cells that can form, it's a very known property, they form teratomas, tumors, but the product, the progeny we transplant is both functional and it's safe. And how we do that, this is a general uh, schematic of how we bring any therapy or any drug into patients. So the, the regular mechanism is clinical trials. We start with, uh, we have phase one, phase two, phase three, where we start with evaluation of toxicity, safety, and then we go increase uh, the patient sample sizes. We we'll look now, after a while, in efficacy, comparative efficacy. So there are also, in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about some mechanisms that can accelerate this process. And there is also, uh, as I'm gonna mention in, in a while, what we call compassionate use. So there are ways to move this, to accelerate this process. But what happens with the business that I'm talking about is they bypass the whole system and they offer their products directly to patients, direct to consumer uh, stem cell interventions. So just to give some more information on how we translate cell or gene therapies, uh, as I mentioned, we have the clinical trials that we test exist in safety and efficacy. Now there are some FDA, and I'm going to talk mostly about the regulatory uh, framework in the United States, but if you have questions about other countries, I'll be happy to answer them. So uh, the FDA has several mechanisms that ex to expand the translation, not necessarily of cell therapy, but also drugs. There is fast track, there is priority review when you shorten the review period, accelerate approval when you look now in the surrogate or intermediate endpoints, and the uh, the breakthrough therapy designation that concerns serious or life-threatening diseases or conditions. And you need some preliminary clinical evidence to substantially prove. Now there are ways also to bypass this clinical trial mechanism. This is called compassionate use, but it has to be very restrictive. So this is an access to unauthorized cell products or gene products for a group of patients that have to be chronically ill, they have to be a, a life-threatening disease. So that happens through the expanded access mechanism in the United States. Now we have more and more uh, legislation in more states and our federal last year. Uh, the right to try that also bypasses FDA and offers these uh, uh, therapies directly to patients without the intervention of the FDA, because in the expanded access it has to be approved by the FDA. And also in the European Union, we have what is called early access to medicines. So now, this is the regular way to go to offer cell or gene therapies to people, demonstrate efficacy, risk assessment, peer review clinical trials, and have a proven therapy. The medical innovation is kind of different. There are, way, there are times when we can bypass this mechanism, we're talking about compassionate use now. And there may be some uh, practical limitations uh, for example, very limited patient sizes, uh, seriously ill patients that it cannot be attributed to placebo for treatment uh, groups. In that case, there's still we still need the rational and preclinical evidence of e efficacy. We need scientific peer review, and then we can treat these patients. If it's possible, we can, should also proceed to clinical trials. But uh, in some cases, that's not possible, and then we can have a proven therapy without clinical trials. And that's the difference between clinical and medical innovation and the regular pathway of translation. But now we have a third pathway, which is extremely problematic. There is no rationale, no preclinical evidence of efficacy, no, there is no peer review. At this point, one should stop. But in business, I'm going to talk to you about that offer unproven stem cell interventions do not stop, and they offer this uh, unproven therapies to patients. So just to summarize the first part of our talk, there are some research and clinical realities. Regenerative medicine is an active and highly promising uh, field. 
Uh, at the same time, there are a few cell-based or gene-based uh, therapies that are standard of care or approved by regulatory agencies. But there is now tension between this reality and basic expectations. There are high global demand for stem cell-based treatments. Patients with chronic or end-stage disease will seek approved stem cell treatments, and these people are motivated by therapeutic hope. They want to be okay to improve their quality of life. Sometimes they know they won't be cured, but they know they hope that some slight improvement in their condition will make a big impact on their quality of life. And the problematic answer to this tension between the clinical and research reality and patient expectation <coughs> has been the worldwide proliferation of businesses, marketing approved and unlicensed stem cell interventions. And this problem has been exacerbated because there are regulatory loopholes or differences in regulatory frameworks across the world. So before I move to the second part, can you please? So how can you define unproven therapies? The first attempt to systematize, uh, to come up with a, a list of criteria how this what an approved or approved therapy cell or gene-based therapy is, was done back in 2016 by the ISD Presidential Task Force. So they come, we came up with a list of criteria, and you can see here that uh, there's a very long list, but I want to emphasize some of these points. There's an unclear scientific rationale, and for me as a basic scientist, that can be a big red flag. If the scientific rationale, the basic scientific rationale is not clear, or it is inexistent, non-existent, that, that you should not just cannot proceed to translation. There is a lack of understanding how things work, the mechanism of action. There are insufficient preclinical data. There is a lack of standardized approach to look at product quality, what you deliver to patients, and inadequate information that is close to patients. And the administration methods are not standardized or non-validated. And of course, all these result in uncontrolled experimental procedures in humans. So this, in the last, I would say, 10 years, we've seen the explosion of this industry. There is a, now a global marketplace for businesses that sell these improvements themselves or cell-based interventions. And in fact, when this phenomenon started 10 years ago and people started taking notice, it was called stem cell medical tourism. Because a lot of people would travel in other countries to receive this type of treatments. Things have changed drastically. And in fact, in 2016, uh, two papers came out. I'm gonna talk to you about in this next slide. So the first paper was by John Rasko, who is also a member of the ISCT, in fact, he's the pre uh, current president of ISCT, a member of the presidency task force. So they saw, in fact, that uh, that's no longer the case. People don't have to travel abroad to receive these treatments. And the top five countries with online marketing of stem cell clinics was USA, India, Mexico, China, and Australia. So there were also highly developed countries in this list there. It was not longer a phenomenon of people traveling to overseas into shady clinics receiving these treatments. And this is a global industry and a high profitable industry. There are not a lot of data, of course, because these businesses do not provide data. But there is an estimate that between 300 million to 44 billion are spent every year on such treatments. So that's a lot of money. The same year, the same issue of cells themselves. Paul Nofler and Lee Turner published a study showing that this is a booming industry in the United States. And that was counterintuitive. Even, even for people that have uh, been working on this, such as myself, that was a shock when I saw this paper and the number of clinics that uh, exist in the United States. I was really shocked. So in that paper, Turner and Nofler identified 351 US businesses that offer this type of intervention. So 570 clinics, and Lee told me that now there is an increasing number and we are currently at more than 700 clinics around the US. So people don't, don't have to travel abroad, and sometimes they don't have to travel in another state. They just take their car and they go to one of these clinics. 
the same time, there are some hotspots. You can identify here of, of more than 10 clinics. And you can see a high concentration in uh, states such as Florida and California. California, Florida, and Texas. And they offer interventions for a wide variety of conditions, from aging, respiratory, immunophobic, you name it, they can offer you treatment for that. But now how that works, and if it's valid, I want to explain what the basic procedure is. So a patient comes, goes to one of these businesses, uh, there is a, some isolation of biological material, it can be fat, blood, bone marrow, there is some isolation of what is called stem cell. Most of the times it's not a stem cell. Same day collection, isolation, readministration. So we take fat, separate some cells, and put them back into the patient. And that's the treatment. As you can see here, the top uh, sources of, of uh, tissue is adipose tissue, bone marrow, and amniotic tissue. So this has been a very popular treatment, and I want to emphasize this because it's uh, such an unproven and most probably totally ineffective treatment. So people use a machine that is been used traditionally in aesthetic surgery to separate fat, fat tissue for uh, reconstruction, for cosmetic reconstruction. They isolate what they call the vascular, stromal vascular fraction. That's a heterogeneous fraction of immune cells, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and stromal cells. So they talk about this fraction being rich in growth factors, stem cells, and then they take this fraction and they put it back to the patients in, uh, with uh, different modes of administration, intravenous, intrathecal, intramuscular, and nucleolized. Now, that's already weird. But what is more weird is you have the exact same treatment for all these conditions. So these clinics take smooth, uh, uh, stroma vascular fraction and they treat multiple sclerosis, ALS, Parkinson, stroke, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injuries, respiratory disease, with the exact same treatment. Well, you don't have to be a stem cell scientist, but this is totally absurd. But you cannot use something that is so uh, not well characterized, you don't even know if there are stem cells there, and treat so many different conditions that have so many different mechanisms. So that's a big red flag, but unfortunately, you don't fall for that. And through years of research, the profile of these businesses has emerged, so how they operate, and the way they operate is quite frightening, because now we're talking about a booming industry that uh, is highly deceiving. They have several mechanisms to sell the product, and essentially to maximize profit based on uh, these treatments. So first of all, there is a lot of misleading advertising. There is direct to consumer advertising, uh, overuse of patient testimonies. They post videos on the internet of patients that are happy. They receive this treatment. They are now uh, okay. Some of them feel okay. That's called the placebo effect. And you always see the video of a patient that received that a week or after the treatment. You never see a video of somebody who received that and then six months later was in front of a camera. There is also abuse of the clinicaltrials.gov. This is a federal website when clinical trials are posted. So a lot of these businesses, they go and post their studies on clinicaltrials.gov. And it's very hard to vet studies there to know if it's a legit or a not legit study. So essentially, they use a federal website as an advertising tool for the patients. There is misrepresentation of risks and benefits. Uh, they portray these treatments as routine extent of experimental or approval, the exaggerated claims of safety and efficacy, that this is safe and is highly efficacious, and neither is true. And of course, there is no patient follow-up or quantitative outcomes, so there's no collection of data. There is weak or absent scientific rationale, and sometimes if there is any scientific literature, and most of the times there is no scientific literature, so these websites is scanned, outdated, or irrelevant. So, for example, you can see a paper on pluripotent stem cell on a website that offers strong and vascular fraction treatments. There are pace, what they call patient seminars, but they are essentially self-pitches. And pressure, which I think I found particularly egregious, 
suppression of prospective patients to take on debt or crowdfund. And more and more patients now resort to crowdfunding uh, websites to raise the money that is necessary for these treatments. So they also used what is called tokens of scientific legit legitimacy because you need to quote the scientific discourse. You need to appear that you are legit. And you know, science is a social enterprise. It has a lot of tokens. And how we legitimize what we do, of course, because we try to be rigorous, but also there are other mechanisms for that. So they use accreditations, ethics, or should they review, and boards and advice. So a lot of the tokens that legitimate science uses are now co-opted by these businesses. And is that ethical? I don't think it's ethical. I think it's highly unethical, and I'll tell you why. So first of all, I don't agree that a lot of people say, OK, caveat emptor, buy your beware is enough. If you try to inform people, and they know this is dangerous or ineffective, uh, that's all you have to do. Scientists just need to talk about these therapies and nothing else. And I don't think this is not uh, is effective anymore. Because we talk about an organized industry that abuses people. So, and we can have this discussion later on. And also there are a lot of types of harms. There is physical harm, there are documented cases of bacterial infections, tumor formation, pulmonary embolism, and even deaths that can be attributed directly to these uh, treatments. There is financial harm. In the US, you can find treatments in the range of $7,500 to $20,000. That's the cost per treatment. But it's a very ineffective treatment. As I told you, separate some fat, put back the SVF into the patient, and that's the treatment. And you, pay, you may pay up to $20,000 for that. And of course, this business is pressure people to come and do repeated treatments to maintain the therapeutic effect. And there is psychological, great psychological harm heightened expectations of people, but of course there are dust hopes there because there is no therapeutic effect, effect whatsoever. So I would say, looking at all these different types of harms, I think this is highly unethical, and we cannot just uh, rely on telling people this, you don't, don't do that, because this is no longer effective. So of course you may be wondering how they manage to escape uh, regulation. And uh, the US FDA has one of the strictest regulatory frameworks and all robust regulatory frameworks in the world. And the way they do that, or they used to do, because now things are changing, uh, they were abusing some loopholes. So FDA has a tiered uh, risk assessment system. Not all cell-based treatments can go through clinical trials, and that's definitely not necessary. For example, organ transplant. You don't need clinical trials for organ transplant. So if you are to transplant the lungs, you never perform clinical trials for that. So there are mechanisms to, first of all, most of the drug, what is called a drug, is to go through uh, clinical trials, pre-market authorization, and demonstrate a demonstration of uh, safety and efficacy. And the main mechanism to do that is clinical trials. And the exceptions that these businesses are, uh, use are two. There is another section of this act that uh, exempts cell products that are minimally manipulated. For example, if you take some bone from somebody and put it back in their mouth as an autologous graph, that doesn't need clinical trials. And so if they're used for homologous use, as I said, bone to perform the same function, and when it's not combined with other articles. So you can, if you can show or if you can interpret that your cell product meets these requirements, you don't really have to go through all this. And there's also what's called a surgical exception that uh, some tissue is taken from a piece of tissue from the same individual and it's used in the same uh, surgical procedure. So most of these businesses interpret their treatments as falling under these two rules. And as I'm going to explain in the next couple of slides, that's been changing now because that has created a lot of issues. So in the third part of my talk, I'm going to give you some more concrete examples of what we do uh, about uh, this issue, how one can, and that draws on my experience through the American Thoracic Society uh, Stem Cell Working Group, because we try to have a multi-pronged approach to counteract this, uh, 
this uh, treatments. And that's an uh, editorial I wrote more than two years ago, it was published in BU today. So I was using strong words here. Clinics make extravagant hollow claims, aggressive marketing, exorbitant out-of-pocket fees, and of course, I stand behind these words today. So that's what I was writing. These are real quotes from websites. Of course, I'm not going to give you the name of the website. But uh, this is an example of these hollow claims, natural healing properties of stem cells, uh, worldwide recognition, revolutionary minimally invasive stem cell therapies for Lyme disease. I've seen thousands of patients increase in quality of life, very vague claims. Because you know, in science, in, when you prove, want to prove something, the devil is in the details. Anybody can say this. Now, this is quite amusing. That's from a clinic abroad. You may not recognize this, but I do, because I took this picture as <laughs> part of my research. And it's in the public domain. So this is an embryonic mouse lung that has a reporter to highlight the epithelium. So it's in the public domain. A clinic found that, and it was using it to advertise idiopathic process <laughs> treatments. They took it down after 10 minutes when I wrote to them. I couldn't even sue them, because they are not in the US. But they took it down. <laughs> so, and uh, for respiratory disease, it's particularly egregious because we know there are better, even if you get, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, on the end of that last slide, you said that they can submit their patient-funded treatments on clinical trials. Yes, um, yeah. Is there no like oversight of that website? Do you know the doc of the uh, uh, The FDA is trying to, uh, and NIH, so this is managed by the NIH, the National Institute of Health and the National Library of Medicine. They are tied try now to take steps to increase the oversight. There are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of trials posted there. This is all clinical trials, not only cell-based trials. So there is minimum oversight for now. But I think they try to address this issue. And I, I, we wrote an editorial last year I can send around if you want to explain more detail how problematic this is. Because patients go to the clinical trials. This is a federal website. I, so they type in COPD and stem cells. And I can tell you, half of the trials they will find are not legit trials, this, this type of treatments. And there's no mention that uh, patient funding that is you have to pay. And there's no mention of uh, absence of regulatory approval, that you don't have a, a investigational new drug uh, application number. So it's very vague. And sometimes people realize this is a paid trial not even try a paid study when they call the clinic. They realize that it's just, uh, it, it's not a legitimate uh, clinical trial. So yeah. is there like no like identifier, like you just said, like, is there some way that if you looked at like two different you know, trials, you could say this one's legit, this one's yes. not just uh, In theory, there is a legit clinical trial should have an IND number. Uh, but sometimes I, I look, because we went, and for this editorial we wrote last uh, year, we went uh, and did a research with other people from the ATS uh, on all cl clinical trials for Lyme diseases. There were about 75 or 80. In fact, a lot of the legit trials didn't even have the identifiers they have to. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you start applying very simple criteria that you have an IND, you cannot post on this website if you don't have an IND, that would kind of clean up this place. They are regulated by the FDA, but they but claim they fall exactly. under the other provisions that are less restrictive. Right, right. Everything is regulated by the FDA. But the regulation cannot be only clinical trials. Regulation can be, even if you provide, let's say, a transplant, you have to register your institution, your uh, establishment with the FDA. You have to make sure that, this, uh, that when you transplant something, is free of bacteria, for example, it's contamination-free. There are certain ways, if you want to provide a cell product, it has to be manufactured under GMP, good manufacturing practice guidelines. So 
uh, even these things are not done. So I, won't, I don't say that if they did these things, they would be good because they are totally ineffective. You could transplant mm -hmm. something that is uh, sterile and okay, but it doesn't have any effect. Yes? Um, I know it's hard because they don't report, but is there any evidence to suggest that these are actually harmful versus just benign and duping people? Like, have there been any stories where potentially there would be, you know, room for legal action because they are actually putting patients in yes. harm's way? So that's, uh, I was going to mention that at the end, but I can talk about that now. There is, in the last, I would say, three to four years, there, are, uh, there is a surge in patient uh, lawsuits, uh, class action lawsuits against these uh, clinics. Now, the problem is, if it's sometimes it's difficult to prove that you will have valid treatment. Because a lot of these patients are chronically ill or late stage patients. Some of them will die after they receive the treatment, but you cannot prove a link unless you do an autopsy and find foreign uh, the patient dies from an embolism, okay? And you do the autopsy and then you realize that this foreign material, what caused the embolism and the death of the patient was cells that were given by one of these clinics. And the other thing that is more harder to prove is uh, that, that there was no efficacy. Because now there are more and more disclaimers. So as you see the evolution of these websites, we went from very short disclaimers to very long disclaimers. Their lawyers tell them now you've got this and this. And after a while, when you read the disclaimers, it's absurd because what they essentially say is this treatment won't do anything to you. So just take the treatment. But if you read the fine print, the, you know, they have lawyers, they have a lot of money, so they're very savvy. And in fact, as you notice, I haven't mentioned a single name of any of these businesses here, just because there is an increased uh, risk of litigation. They will take it to the courts. If you say something and name a particular business, they will just sue you right away. So it's still very bad. But uh, I hope that will change because more and more patients, and I will also show you there is a lot of negative publicity these days in uh, large circulation media. So uh, things, I think the public perceptions also start to change. So for respiratory diseases, as I said, it's very, even if you had the perfect cell in the lab, you made the perfect cell for any type of respiratory disease, it would be very difficult to deliver it and make it a graft and uh, uh, improve the, the condition. Because there are no approved stem cell or cell-based therapies for disease of the respiratory system in the US or anywhere in the world. And the good thing is a lot of patient disease uh, the foundations have issued notes of caution regarding this improvement cell therapy. So that's a nice way to reach out to the patients and say, no matter what your condition is, do not go to these clinics. And as a part of the uh, American Thoracic Society Stem Cell Working Group, uh, we started back in 2013. So we tried to have a combined effort in advocacy and education. We published a lot of papers. Uh, mostly editorials and perspectives uh, in the literature. So I'm happy that, in fact, for this field, the respiratory disease and improvement stem cell interventions, members of the group created the literature. There was nothing before 2016. We were, in, uh, we were engaging uh, federal agencies and we're giving them on feedback on regulation rules and even back channels when we say, I want to report this uh, clinic. I saw them, I read the website. They seem to be particularly egregious. Can you take a look at them? Uh, we had a lot of communication channels with patient foundations, scientific societies, and respiratory and thoracic society, not, societies, not only in the US, but also abroad. And we also tried to kind of disseminate this knowledge in a more accessible layman format through webinars, a position statement, scientific sessions, and a patient information um, uh, data set. So I think most. Uh, uh, very few medical societies do that, and it's very important to get medical societies involved in that because a lot of the practitioners, a lot of the people that offer these treatments are, uh, are MDs. And they're not, for example, you will never find a pulmonologist in any of these clinics, not a single one that offers treatments for respiratory diseases because they all know they're highly ineffective, but you will always find some MDs that are willing to give them, provide their name. And, uh, 
administered the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. What type of doctors are they normally? Are they claiming to be GPs or? I think there are a lot of general practitioners, yes. And most of the times they are not relevant to the, the treatment that is being treated. For example, if it's a neurological condition, you will not, never find a neurologist applying this. And in fact, most uh, specialists will never endorse the, any of these treatments. And they're generally MDs? Yes, they're MDs. And now the other issue is uh, state medical boards, uh, they haven't taken a lot of action against these people. And, Again, because it's sometimes you have to go through a formal procedure. You cannot just put people in front of a fire squad and just start firing. So you have to have a process, due process. And sometimes it's hard to prove that the treatment caused any harm. But of course, from the financial harm. So in the, the, the evidence, the, the burden of evidence is quite high for the state medical boards to take this action. And as I just mentioned, there is, I think there is a change, so I'm quite optimistic, uh, although we have a highly organized and profitable industry, uh, that this will be now start taking hits. In the, I would say, in the last two or three years, we start seeing increasingly negative public perceptions of unproven stem cell interventions. There were scholarly literature in the past showing that a lot of the media, these treatments were portrayed under a positive life in the, in the media newspapers, uh, online news. But uh, what helped is some highly publicized cases of patients harmed by improvement cell-based interventions. And I would say, for me, currently, the biggest harm is not physical harm, it's financial harm. But it's not as visible or as high public, highly publicized as these cases. So there were three women in Florida. They received intravitreal, so they got injections in their eyes. In fact, the same, both eyes at the same day, no legit ophthalmologist will ever do that, of stem cells, some stomach cells, and they all got blind. So that was highly publicized. The FDA now has intervened. There was a tumor growth of somebody who got several stem cell transplants, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so they have been publicized. Case and there was a patient in Australia that died of an embol pulmonary embolism after she received one of these treatments. And now we're also seeing an, an increasingly negative coverage by lay press and by big outlets such as the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and the Europe Times. And some of them are quite, you know, the wording is very strong. Mod modern Parker, miraculous. Quote, unquote, quote, stem cell therapy has sickened people in five states. So that's good that there is a lot of negative publicity uh, to scare people away from this. Although I do believe that people have to realize it's not the physical harm, it's mostly the psychological, financial harm, and the total absence of efficacy of these treatments. And also, the FDA has finally taken action. And this is a timeline I made for the last 10 years of regulatory action of the FDA on the uh, tissue and, uh, and cell products. As you can notice here, before 2016, there is very little happening. Some warning letters to some of these companies, that you know, this, uh, you, your uh, facilities are not clean, things like that. There was a lengthy, lengthy legal battle between the FDA and the regenerative sciences. Uh, so, as I mentioned, now ex vivo expanded mesenchymal stromal cells are regulated as drugs because this company were offering expanded MSCs and saying this is surgical intervention. Now, after 2016, we have the introduction of the enactment of the 21st Century Act, the introduction of a new regulatory framework to regulate these treatments. And there is a lot, of a lot of things happening in the last two years or so. A lot of warning letters, more concrete action, for example, the seizure of a vaccine, an unproven vaccine from STEM immune. The FTC also got involved, the Federal Trade Commission, for uh, false advertising. They took action against some stem cell clinics. And last year, the FDA uh, sought permanent injunctions against two stem cell clinics. And most importantly, a stem cell clinic network. 
So I think now the FDA is going, uh, uh, is following the right tactics. It goes after stem cell clinic networks because a lot of these clinics are not individual. They, uh, they are organized in networks. So if you want to hit them, you just have to hit the network and make uh, the action more uh, meaningful. And now, as I just mentioned, they have uh, the new guidelines, the new guidances say that S, stromal vascular fraction, is not homologous use anymore. You cannot claim this is homologous use for a surgical intervention. If you use SVF, then it is regulated as a drug. It has to go through clinical trials. And I think that's also a good thing, because it was being abused by many of these clinics. So targeting stem cell clinical networks, uh, going particular, after particularly egregious cases of clinics that inject or infuse cells in the central nervous system or bloodstream, which is essentially most of them. And the introduction of a new regulatory pathway, what is called the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy uh, pathway, that needs some preliminary clinical evidence. Because an argument against the current regulatory framework was that uh, it's too, uh, it takes a lot of time, money, and effort to get cell or gene therapies into the pipeline, to the patient, and to the patients. Now we have this accelerated pathway that is specific to regenerative medicine. Right at the moment, we have 30 uh, RMAT designations as of February of this year. And which means that if these are promising therapies, promising treatments, they will get into accelerated pathway and they may end up reaching the patients early on. Doesn't, in fact, that it's not an endorsement of these clinics because some of them tried to go through this pathway and they got rejected due to absence of even minimal clinical evidence. And my last slide what we can do by moving forward. So three quotes here, three types of actions. This is one of my favorite quotes from Paolo Bianco, who was a stem cell biologist, uh, and wrote, comes from a perspective he wrote with a stem cell scientist. Mechanistic insight is not a dispensable intellectual luxury. And as a basic scientist, that resonates a lot with me. So we need rigorous preclinical research but they also need realistic timelines for clinical translation. Unfortunately, a lot of the expectations and the hype has not been created by the clinics, has been created by us, has been created by stem cell biologists and people that do research in regenerative medicine. Because we are all very enthusiastic, and of course, uh, we're not saints. There's a lot of conflict of interest. We want more grant money. We want to keep doing our research. So people will hype their research. But that means that patients are want to get this treatment. So if you cannot offer them, you offer the hype, then the clinic will come and say, here, the treatment is here, and don't listen to the scientists. So we also have to be more careful of what we say and how realistic we are with our timelines. We have to think globally, but act locally. So we need to have national networks, clinicians, scientists, and patient advocates, and education campaigns. And of course, when everything else fails, you can always speak softly, but you have to carry a big stick. So patient class action lawsuits are on the rise. There is more swift regulatory action. And hopefully, there will be increasing clinical self-policy through state medical boards in the future. So I have a list of resources here. And I can email you any of these. Uh, any particular paper you're interested in, if you're interested in the uh, area of the whole uh, phenomenon of improvement stem cell interventions. And, uh, this is more lab uh, oriented, so a lot of the resources we develop through the ATS stem cell working group. And with that, I'm going to finish with some, some acknowledgements. Uh, people have worked closely in uh, now fund, stem cell working group of the American Thoracic Society. Hopefully, we'll have a regenerative medicine interest group in this year. Dan Weiss, Darcy Wagner, Angela Panoskaltis, and Rob Feistat. Also, the ADS that helped a lot with these activities. Patient foundations in the respiratory disease patient foundations. Massimo Dominici, who is the president of the, the chair of the ASCT for the Vessel Task Force, Lee Turner, Nati Quende, Taxi. 
and also my colleagues at the Center for Regenerative Medicine that work on lung stem cell biology that make it uh, very exciting and fun to do this type of research. Thank you for your attention. And I thank you. Yes. Um, so going back to your point about how research gets overhyped a lot. Yes. Um, and so this is like one example of the many things that could go wrong. Like this, it could be stem cell therapy. It could be many other. I'm sure there's lots of other, I, I guess, fraudulent activities out there. Um, and something that I've noticed is that like science often gets talked about in almost like a religious sense, where we yes. try to tell them believe this. Like one one thing that one phrase that's really common is like, do you believe in global warming or right. something? It's yes. like, that's like such an unscientific thing to say, but it gets said all the time. And so how, how do you think we can work to counteract this problem and to help the public understand that science is, like there's always a level of skepticism? And with this, even like, like no matter, because I want to present things of something in terms of like, do I believe it or do I not believe it? You can throw any amount of evidence at mm -hmm. someone; they, it doesn't help at all. Um, so, like when you when you have a word like stem cell and it sounds scientific, it kind of pushes them to think, yes. oh well, I should believe it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of great points and a lot of questions. Yeah. So I'll start with the last one. Yes, uh, don't think that explaining things in better scientific terms or more detail will help. Because this, for example, the term stem cell has been coined by it. Now it went into the part, it's pop, part of pop culture anymore. You can, you can say this is not a stem cell, it's a facultative progenitor or whatever, or transit amplifying cell. It won't help for people to understand that this is not effective. So I would say you have to mm -hmm. emphasize the harm, but uh, don't do that because there's no evidence, there's no efficacy. Instead of lecturing people or oh, this is not scientifically sound. So when you reach out to the public, sometimes giving more information, I think there are uh, uh, studies that have shown the same phenomenon in the anti-vax uh, movement. When you try to get more and more scientific information to people about vaccines, sometimes it just get more entrenched to their opinions and it just doesn't help. Now the more general problem you rightly point out about the religious connotations of that's uh, that's true. In fact, that doesn't come from these clinics; it comes from us, from scientists. And I would say that's the ideology of scientism: that scientists, scientists, science has all the answers to all our problems, and we can uh, have better societies just through better science and technology. I don't espouse this uh, ideology. Uh, I think science is a very important. Uh, enterprise, but it's a social enterprise, so we have our faults, uh, we are humans, and we try to be rigorous, so apply methods, but at the same time we operate in societies, and we have to get money, so we hide. And so there is some controversy how you can get more money, how to demonstrate to people, and now it's not only your peers, now it becomes more and more important to address space and foundations, funding agencies, administrators that are, are not scientists. And then, sometimes by definition, you have to hide. So I would say yes, you have to be humbler, to not say uh, that everything we do will uh, result to cures or to improve dramatically the quality of life. Because, by the way, if even if we have a good and there are concrete examples, a proven therapy. Some of these therapies now are very expensive. Gene therapies can be in the order of uh, half a million dollars. Who's going to pay for that? So we also have to address these questions that come up when you bring a therapy to patients. And this has nothing to do with science. It has to do with how we manage healthcare, how we provide healthcare, equity. And these are not basic scientific questions. So I totally agree with you. We cannot hide. And regenerative medicine, same thing. It's a promising uh, modality that we can treat conditions with regenerative medicine. It's not going to fix all our problems, and if people live in polluted areas and they have lung disease because they inhale polluted air every single day, the solution is not to give them bioengineered lungs. That's definitely not the solution. Thanks for the question. Yeah. So I guess just as a follow-up to like the previous question, um, so 
you emphasized on how um, using a different like terminology, for example, not calling something a stem cell, calling it something else, um, that doesn't necessarily work. You have to emphasize like the chemical effects yes. of that therapy. So, but a lot of the time though, uh, when you do something like that, and let's say it is effective in emphasizing how powerful it is, people believe it, um, then what the companies would tend to do is they would take a different term and just change the way that, like, oh, this is not a stem cell, this is some other thing. Yes. And then, like, the cycle just keeps going yes. on and on right. and on. Like, yes. like so, so, like, is there any way to, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. If that's <laughs> no, that's, that's true, and that's a real problem. Because, and we see that in real time happening, now there is a lot of uh, regulatory action, and by the way, it's good that the FDA is now involved because for these companies don't listen to anything else. The moment they start receiving warning letters and inspections from the FDA, that's when they realize they cannot proceed anymore. But as you say, they now change the terminology. A lot of these, they would switch overnight and they would say, okay, we don't offer stem cell-based therapies, we offer cell-based therapies. And then it will be platelet-rich plasma not even a cell therapy, because now they know this is not regulated as strictly as cell-based therapies. And they will start talking about uh, uh, extracellular vesicles, which is a new area of research, things that cells release and may have a beneficial effect on other cell types. And that's even easier to do, because now you just pin down the cells, you don't have any cells, you take the supernate and then give it to patient. So fortunately, that will continue. And there is, don't think there is an easy way out or a easy solution to this problem. That they will try to find the next loophole that will provide them with huge margins, uh, profit margins. Um, to that point, how many of these patients do you think have gone through traditional therapies? And how many yeah. maybe can't afford traditional therapies? Right. So a lot of patients, and that comes from my discussions with clinicians, a lot of the people I work with, uh, fact, Almost all of them, apart from Jason, are clinicians. So they also see patients that do basic research. They also look at see a lot of patients. Most of them have gone through the traditional uh, paths. And for respiratory diseases, it's particularly bad because there are no, a lot of uh, later stages, there are not a lot of treatment options. Mm -hmm. So I understand that I, was, I don't think we should be confrontational with patients that want to go to these clinics. Because they, it's, and there is a lot of sociological studies showing that there is not a uniform attitude towards this uh, treatments from patients. Some patients uh, believe in a religious sense. Some people are very skeptical, but they would still go and say, I have nothing to lose. Well, they have to lose a lot of money, but they think that at least something may happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, most of these patients have exhausted. And it's not only for respiratory disease, for neurological diseases and lot of other conditions, have exhausted all conventional treatment options. And when they hear their uh, doctor, their physician saying that, you know, there's no much I can do about you, then they will try to find something.